All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rome. Where are we? So this is the first 30 minute lecture. There will be some crosstalk audio bleeding through. That should work out just fine. So let's get going. Hello, everyone. I'm David Getson. Welcome to the course Rome. Where are we? with the John David Ebert School for the Study of Culture, Cosmology, and the Arts. So it is Friday, November 18th, and uh, this lecture being relevant to our uh, discussion to follow. Introduction. Today we're going to rapid fire through some big concepts. I'll check in with everyone's relative familiarity with first century BC Rome. Uh, by the way, just as a, a note, um, I hope people find this amusing rather than off-putting. I'll never use BCE and CE. That's ridiculously condescending fakery. And BC means before Christ, before the anointed one, uh, literally. No matter who you are or what you believe, who can, can argue with that? That's, that's what they say people did to him. So that's sensible. AD is usually Anno Domini, meaning in the year of our Lord. But this is so easily fixed for anyone... Uh, that doesn't worship Jesus, A.D. can just mean in the, whatever Latin gets conjugated to, in the year of their Lord. So uh, look that up if anybody knows uh, the acronym stays the same. Uh, no need to somehow pretend that a common era somehow has nothing to do with assumptions about the historicity of Jesus. Well, with that out of the way, uh, I once made uh, some real career friction in a Ph.D. program uh, simply by telling that joke, if you can believe it, but... Uh, Maybe you can. Uh, today, we'll go through names and ideas very quickly. Uh, so please resist the temptation to pause and uh, look things up for today. Some of you may already know all the historical names here. If you don't, just wait for a while. Uh, we'll be exhaustive soon in the next session. So the late Republic of Rome, and especially the first half of the first century BC, is a time where we know much more detail about people in Rome itself than we know about other places at other times. And that might be why we have such a, a connection to it, uh, why it's so easy for this analogy, uh, wondering about how the United States connects to Rome might happen. We know more about Rome at this time than uh, about Constantinople at the time of Justinian more than we do about the Babylonian kings, more than we do from the Mayan chronicles, more even than we know about the court of Emperor Charlemagne in 800 AD. And at least I think that the story itself, it's, it's hard to make fiction more gripping than this if you tried. The narrative is so good and that the names and dates and themes come automatically. So uh, please do let me know for our discussion what questions, uh, if any, are most prominent for you. So, people say history never repeats, but it rhymes. Does the U.S. echo Rome? By how much? How far along are we? Where does the path diverge? How do we understand the connections? What are the limits to the analogy? Is the analogy predictive to any degree? And what do we do about it? Perhaps the most vital, important question. Yet the one that people, when they're going over this or speaking about it, tend to avoid. Most historians in most schools would not feel comfortable around these questions, but this is not most schools, and I am not most historians. History is not a science. It is a rationally interpretive art, but perhaps the same can be said of stock market analysis. The only real way we imagine the future is by modifying some idea we have of the past. So this is where we start. My favorite Leibniz quote, and he has many good ones, is in the Monadology from 1714, commenting on the generality and the specificity of reason and science. The quote is, We are all empiricists when we expect the sun to come up in the morning, but only an astronomer calculates it by reason. Cycles are everywhere, large and small, intersecting and interacting. Our heartbeats, 
our steps, our sleeping. Yes, the sun, the planets, and seasons, meteor showers, and comet orbits up to precession of the equinoxes, galactic rotation, and who knows yet what we don't yet understand. Roughly in the middle of this spectrum of scales uh, sits the life cycles of nations, empires, and cultures. These cycles are not so small as to be obvious and not so large that they appear deterministic. Is it all pareidolia? Pattern matching that is just coincidence? If so, it is the kind of coincidence that is like a clock coinciding to the sky. It will tell you what time or even season it is and roughly when the sun comes up. Even people who would dismiss the idea of cyclical historic analogy tend to make decisions based on these analogies. And just think about all the popular press weak sauce analogy to either Hitler or Watergate to see how something that is perhaps only 10% true can still have a powerful hold on the beliefs and, yes, actions of the public. Would there be a method? a key of sorts, a way to look at the patterns in history themselves, to discover a way to make those 10% uh, true analogies get to say 60% true, 80% or even 90% true, true enough to inform actions or even make accurate forecasts. What could we do about it? If roughly a hundred years ago, another independent scholar published an exhaustive work on this topic and then made predictions, most of which ended up to be unsettlingly true. We'll treat this more in more depth later on, but as you know, a philosopher of history, Oswald Spengler, articulated his analysis of civilizational life cycles in The Decline of the West, or rather untranslatably Untergang des Abendlandes, uh, under path of the evening lands is, is my own crack at it at the moment. The German carries knowing connotations that are simultaneously Nietzschean and Egyptian. To brutally, to brutally paraphrase those very concepts of Spengler's system by way of an example prediction, paraphrasing his prediction, at the turn of the second religiousness, look for the rise of the petty Caesars. So, Spengler seeing civilizations rise, civilizations fall. If you understand the pattern of rise and fall, you can understand your current civilization by seeing how the rise and fall happened in the past and see where stuff matches up, right? That's what we're, what we're thinking about. But, but what's he talking about? Second religiousness? At the end of a civilizational cycle, as new challenges disrupt the systems that were once optimally tuned to older challenges, the cultural sleep of atheism shakes rudely out from a reassertion of the old religion. As conservative people search for solutions in what used to work well, meanwhile liberals and radicals seek solutions in the innovative, the foreign, and the exotic. This is where we are culturally in the world generally, especially in the United States. This is where Rome once was in the, uh, the late Republic. Now it helps to getting more specific. It helps to draw these in, in parallel columns if you want to. Our timeline, fundamentalism, let's see if I can get in frame. Our timeline, doesn't really matter, our timeline, fundamentalism, the religious right, Billy Graham, trad Catholic versus New Age hippie crystals, teal swan, and drum circles. Okay, that's the conservative liberal thing there. A conservative liberal split on Rome's timeline. I think of that maybe over here. Cult of Vesta, the renovated temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the Stoic philosopher Posidonius of Rhodes, civic religion versus mystery cults, Eastern mysticism, meaning Egypt and Syria, and in the first century BC, the, the capital of Jewish scholarship was Alexandria, good old Philo, 
um, the Kaikion Brew at Eleusis, and Dionysian Theater. So you can either, if you got that memorized, perfect, you can skip back, you can look at what you wrote, and then just think about how those relate to each other, that you have kind of a conservative radical division in the culture, they're facing problems in different ways, and what we are going through now acts, uh, can be understood as a kind of mirror to what was happening with the Romans. And to get more specific, more tantalizingly specific, so from out of the time, out of the soup of the second religiousness, you get the petty Caesars. And what's meant by that? One of the ways to understand it, before Julius Caesar, there were small, small versions of him. Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, Marius, Sulla, Crassus, and Pompey, all of which we'll go over more in detail later. And here we come to a fine point with the analogies. John and Robert Kennedy, several presidents ending in Trump, because Marius, that's the way I do it, Marius had many consulships. Then Joe Biden, Elon Musk, and thank goodness we haven't seen a Pompey yet. He's probably a millennial. So, already we can see that in comparing Rome to the USA, it is very dramatic to speak, as some people do sometimes with the analogy, of Visigoths, the sack of Rome, and the 400s AD, but let's look at the general timeline, because where, where do we think we would be? I, I tend to think that we're at the late Republic. I think that fits, so I got the whole sweep of Roman history. So this, what we're going through here, is the conceptual express route. Uh, we'll take our time with this soon enough. As I mentioned in the course promo video, and this was an analogical uh, framework deftly articulated by Mike Duncan in Storm Before the Storm, and this is his book, I don't think he was looking much into Spengler, and that strengthens the independent conclusions, if so. Uh, but Mike observed, Rome was founded, and keep in mind U.S. history as we're going along, Rome was founded as a colony of wayward men seeking fortune and liberty, alternately friendly and brutal to local neighbors. Rome was ruled by foreign monarchs. They overthrew this monarchy, established a republic, eventually dominating the land of those kings. In the wake of a revolt of farm laborers, this maps to the U.S. Civil War, a broadening of citizenship and voting rights occurred. The plebeians getting the tribunes and popular assembly um, wrested from the rule of the patricians, this this fight in Rome maps onto something like the direct election of senators and the rise of primary elections and universal suffrage in, uh, in this universal white suffrage after Reconstruction ended in the South. Before that, it was only property owners. Military trouble then arose across the waters in a clash of empires. Rome, supposedly reluctantly, intervenes uh, on behalf of their cultural forebears, their, their Greek, Greek allies, uh, the Greeks mapping on to the United Kingdom in, in, this, in this case. Um, these are the Punic Wars. We count three of them. But the third uh, was really a mopping up operation with some, um, with, I'll do apologies to the burning of Carthage. Um, it was a mopping up operation with some free trade agreements imposed, and Carthage demilitarized. For us, that maps onto World War I, World War II, uh, with Hannibal being Hitler, and yes, I do suspect that the Romans would also keep on and on talking about, oh, so-and-so is the next Hannibal. We can't appease the next Hannibal, the Hannibal, and so, and so forth. The end of the Cold War roughly maps on to the end of the Third Punic War. You get a disturbingly precise parallel between the assassinated Gracchi, two, two uh, tribunes of the 
plebeians and the assassination of the Kennedys. Though, Dan Carlin has called this analogy glib. He, um, and I can understand that, he, he still used the analogy in his analysis. And by Spengler's estimation, we would be in our time right now in, 20, in uh, 2022, John will correct me if my arithmetic is off, uh, that we would have been up to the year uh, 100 BC at the year 2000. During World War I, Spengler predicted that the US and Russia would emerge dominant unless Germany checked Russia, which he for good reason desperately wanted to happen, and the EU, despite the NSDAP monkey wrench, which, um, which Spengler decried after he realized what they were actually up to, which he figured out pretty quickly, um, they set Germany back. And then eventually, with uh, uh, Helmut Kohl and then Angela Merkel, Germany did the thing that Spengler said Germany would probably do, which is lead Europe, uh, continental Europe, in economy and production, and therefore politically, which they generally did. The EU did this for a time, checking Russia. Now we're seeing that dissolve, but that's, uh, that's another matter. So 100 BC at 2000 puts us just puts us right now just past the 80s BC. If we're being extremely strict, and this is a bit of a loose focus type thing, if we're being extremely strict, that puts us at 78 BC, I believe. Uh, and this is the time of Marius and generally the time of Marius and Sulla, and of furtive whispers of civil war, civil unrest, and of the marches onto the Capitol Hill. Marius and Sulla and Put, oh, I, I mean Mithridates, you know, the, the so-called poison king, um, were all part of that time, but more on those real pieces of work later on. So, we can see the framework here. So now we can take a step back, let some of that digest. I'm sure all of you have a lot of really excellent questions, which I'm looking forward to here. I'm looking forward to the discussion tomorrow. I wanted to have, to not overwhelm everybody with the, the reading, especially because uh, we're, we're really bootstrapping the thing, to just look over this short poem. Um, Spengler was a great admirer of, and I think we'll touch in on this the, the week after. You'll hear, be, be hearing more about the philosophical method in next week's stuff. Goethe describes how, Goethe, Freudian slip, Spengler describes how his method of analysis was really important. And one of the reasons that the guy is so darn difficult to read is that he'll switch between historical analysis and the philosophy of history. And he kind of, it's a hard thing to do, and no one had quite been doing it like him previously. Hegel, I think, had come the closest of trying to find a structure. I don't, I don't think it's fully appreciated. I have not heard anyone else talk about this, about how Hegel serves as a backdrop. Uh, to, you, you could say that Kant serves as a backdrop to all. Um, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, Kant. I can't sneeze like that all the time. Uh, Kant serves as a backdrop to all German intellectuals who come after him. Um, but Hegel did an interesting kind of historiography that he saw a kind of telos, a shape, a pattern in history. Uh, and with him, he thought that this was a resolution of contradictions until a system would be fully aligned. Um, and he saw it as a spiritual dialectic. It was the opposite of what Marx did with his material dialectics. This is getting a little far afield. But Spengler, I think, was trying to look at that. He, whether, whether he was commenting directly on it or not or reacting to it, I think Spengler was being much more empirical than either Marx or Hegel. That he was looking, he was, he was actually looking in detail at what happened in history and the way that things were related. And he said that his method of, um, he was influenced by both Goethe and Nietzsche. Nietzsche in, in the sense of, um, 
in the sense of the progression of of history Nietzsche had the idea of ideas the, the famous phrase that uh, that everything takes time even the light of the stars takes time and this you know in, in this in, in this light of the in the madman in the Freudliche visions in the joyful science saying that even though religion had crumbled that these common people it had not reached them yet because the idea that ideas travel through time that there is a rise of a religion, that there's a fall of a religion, that you could have an idea of, and I think this is very sophisticated how Nietzsche does this, and I'm sure you guys are hearing about this in the other class. Um, I think it's productive to have Nietzsche and Spengler together. So that's good if some of you guys are taking both of it, but there's the idea that's in that, uh, that because you have this, um, in, in the beginning of Also Sprach, you have the, uh, the death of God is discussed, but who is it discussed by? It's, it's discussed by Zarathustra, it's discussed by Zoroaster, someone who, ev who everyone knows brings about a new feeling of the divine because the old feeling of the divine had fallen apart and that that was the death of God, I think, properly understood. And so Spengler is looking at the death of a culture or a death of a birth of a culture and the death of a culture and the birth of a civilization and the death of a civilization. He inherits that from Nietzsche. And I believe that he's kind of, uh, in the sense of telos going through history, um, that he and poss possibly both he and Nietzsche were influenced by Hegel in that respect. And Goethe, well, Goethe, der Dichter, the, the, the great poet, what, what, what does he contribute? Well, morphology. Morphology being the examine of, examination of shape. But not just shape, but shape and growth. This is very important to understand with, with morphology, that shape is um, the, the idea of how do you get a tree from a seed? It's in there. Goethe was obsessed with that, and he thought that the, the idea of the Urpflanze was not that he was looking for an ancestor of all plants. He was looking for the schematic of plant growth itself. And he actually did a pretty good job figuring out how he understood everything as an iteration of leaf and stem, which is a pretty darn good description of how plants actually grow. And so Goethe, well, excuse me, uh, Spengler was thinking, well, maybe a civilization can work like that. That there's a, there, there's a birth, a peak, a death, and that there are certain hallmarks that you can see through time. And, and if you can understand that, then you can make better decisions about you as an individual. The culture could make better decisions, and that's what he was wanting to do. Uh, so, uh, I think it's very important to pay attention to what authors put at the beginning of their work. And uh, there's this poem. Uh, I'll just read the German first. I think you guys are going to have an email. I'm going to send you an email with the kind of uh, clunkified translation here. But do the German first, and if you have the, the English next to you, take a look at that while we go over it. So, this is at the beginning of Decline of the West. Wenn, in, wenn im Unendlichen dasselbe sich wiederholend ewig fließt, das tausendfaltige Gewölbe sich kräftig ineinander schließt, strömt Lebenslust aus allen Dingen, dem kleinsten wie dem größten Stern und alles Drängen, alles Ringen ist ewige Ruhe in Gott. Dem Herrn. So, when, uh, as in the infinite, the same repetitive, eternal flows, um, the thousand manifold, um, folded, um, what is that, go vault? Uh, I'm not sure what that word is, but the is some, some, pro probably like the orb of the heavens. You could look that up later. That joins together vigorously. 
Love for life flows from all things, from the smallest as well as the largest star, and all, all, all pushing, all struggling. That's like all, all this, uh, uh, like in the Ode to Joy, a la Goethe, a la um, all, all, all the things that seem conflicts to us are actually eternal peace in the eyes of God. So that's part of the objective of Spengler's, that is that we can step above, that we can get a little bit, a, a little bit closer uh, to a divine perspective, get, get above our day-to-day -day monkey mind perspective, and understand what's going on with history, and perhaps tap into that sense of peace to resolve contradictions by understanding the historical process. Yeah, there's a lot going on today. I don't think we're going to get obsessed with current events. We have, um, they're one of the things, but we can mention them from time to time. One thing that caught my eye is recently there was a Florida court decision. There was, there's this cultural struggle now, as there was then. The, and this fits into the second religiousness. So some of you may be familiar with it. There was a Florida, uh, I, I don't know whether, whether it was a law or an executive order, but Ron DeSantis and folks down in Florida passed something saying that the universities were not supposed to have uh, this uh, critical race theory and or woke ideology. The reasoning behind that was this stuff has gotten bad enough that, um, that it's doing things like uh, like this ideology they feel, and I think there's a point to this violating freedom of speech, shutting down people's freedom of speech. So this is something that's, that's curtailing people's rights. And so they say, okay, if you're taking actions that are curtailing rights, we're going to pass a law saying you can't do that. Federal judge looked at that and said, no, you, you, you can't make the excuse of curtailing rights in order to stop the curtailing of other rights. As you look at the history of the Roman Republic, as it goes on and intensifies, that theme of curtailing some rights in order to ensure other rights are preserved becomes more and more intense and doesn't go away until finally Augustus just has everybody shut their eyes and pretend that they're in a republic. And the telling statement from this judge was that we are, uh, he was talking about, uh, he, he quotes the stupid democracy dies in darkness, Washington Post nonsense. And then he, he says that the, the professors, the professors being, and a lot of people are commenting on this, rightly so, the professors being the priests of democracy cannot be curtailed. I like to imagine that as like Catherine Hepburn being the judge. It's, this is, this seems crazy to me. It seems crazy to a lot of people. Sometimes I might be a teacher. I would never consider myself a priest of anything. I might consider myself a spiritual person, hopefully. Priest of democracy? Are you kidding me? So the, here, here we have this, this bizarre resurfacing of religious sentiment that in time magazine talking about how religion is dead and the secularization as industrialism happened in the second 20th century and then oh whoops the iranian revolution oh the religious right and it's been going on for some time and it's intensifying intensifying and intensifying because people are looking to solutions and how they feel about themselves and how they feel about the world and god so there's going to be this conflict that's going to play out one way or the other. Analogy is not destiny, but I'm very much looking forward on this, uh, this adventure of analysis with you. I'm so glad that we're moving forward. Thank you guys so much for signing up. I'm looking forward to it. We're uh, closing up rather neatly on the 30 minutes. I think this will be a good pattern. Um, and thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, John, for organizing this and your infrastructure and the good momentum um, and for, for putting up with the, uh, the, some of the, some of the quick short notice work here. 
So I think we're going to smooth things out and get regular process as we go forward. Very much looking to speaking with you all next time.